You're listening to Fundshack. I'm Ross Butler, and today I'm speaking with Alejandro Alcalde Rash, Senior Director in Advent International's Portfolio Support Group. Alejandro joined Advent in 2010, and his job is to help improve the performance of portfolio companies. His previous roles include Chief Transformation Officer and Head of Supply Chain at Grua when it was a private equity backed company, and before that, he was a partner at McKinsey. Today, we're going to get under the bonnet of private equity value creation. Alejandro, welcome to Fundshack. Can you just explain to us what the Portfolio Support Group is? So what's, what does Portfolio Support Group mean? Well, thank you very much for having me, uh, Ross. And yeah, what's Portfolio Support Group? Um, what's our mission? Our mission is to uh, support management in everything around the value creation uh, programs um, that we want to get implemented in our portfolio companies. So we're, we're coming with a slightly different background than our colleagues from the deal team side. So typically we have a combination of uh, consulting experience in the first place, so kind of learning the, the toolbox, what are the different tools in the, in, the, in the toolbox that you have. And then ideally we'd like to see uh, colleagues who have also been able to implement, to use those tools in, in practical life. So my background is kind of representative. So first at McKinsey, learning a lot about uh, operations excellence and strategy and consulting tools. But then also uh, within Grow, I was responsible for actually uh, getting those tools uh, into action. And so we like to see people who have this this uh, this dual experience. And then our mission is to, to sit together with the management teams and to align on the value creation plan, set up the right governance to, uh, to execute those value creation plans and then support uh, as we go along uh, with the implementation of all the different different programs. All right. So would it be fair to say that typically people in the portfolio support group would have more industry experience like in, in companies than people in the deal investment side? I would say so, although we have a lot of uh, people that also have a background which mm. is outside the, the finance, finance uh, the pure investment banking world but on the portfolio support group side yes yeah we love to see people who have also gotten their hands hands mm. dirty and who have practical management experience because then it's also easier to interact with the with the management teams you know they mm. probably recognize that there are commonalities between yourself and and them and uh, and it's also for you it's probably easier if you have sat in the um, if you have sat in the same chairs, yeah, if you have also been responsible for getting value creation plans implemented, because then you know what's difficult, what's not so difficult, and you know the challenges, and you have a, probably a better understanding of the of uh, the situation the management teams uh, will be in. Oh, yeah. So particularly not just working in a company, but working in a private equity backed company. That that well. certainly helps. It's always good when I can introduce myself and 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 say that, well, I've sat on the same side of, of, of the table as, as, as they are sitting right now. So what might be helpful is maybe to go through the chronology of a, of a deal from your perspective, because I think most of our listeners will be very familiar with the investment um, of course, yeah. perspective. Um, so uh, I guess the simplistic way to think about your role is the deal guys come up with it, you know, they find a company they like, they do their due diligence, they buy it and they pass it over to you mm. uh, to improve it before exit. How does it actually work? <laughs> no, the, the reality looks slightly different. So first of all, it's it's always good um, if we have the chance to to get involved uh, already before the deal is executed or done. So in the ideal world, I would be joining uh, our colleagues uh, during the due diligence phase. I would be also attending management presentations, expert meetings. It's always good if if you get to know management early on and they also have a chance to see you as part of the of the larger um, uh, private equity company uh, team. Um, so very important early on that you're part of the definition of the value creation plan, at least how how we see it. Um, and then subsequently, once once we're in the lucky position that we we won the deal, um, we've signed the deal, uh, then to use the time between signing and closing as much as possible and within the restrictions that the deal situation uh, may provide, to already work on what are the next steps, how is the how are the first three, four, five, six months going to look like, what are the things that we would like to achieve, and if there is a chance already to pre-align these uh, with the management team. I'm just slightly intrigued around the dynamic between the investment professionals and the portfolio support group professionals, particularly at this 
at this point, because let's say I'm an investment guy and, you know, I really want to do this deal. Um, how do I view the portfolio support group person? How do I, how do I most effectively use them at that stage? That's a good question because it's actually kind of, kind of tricky. We are probably uh, the ones in the team who have, because of our background and our say own management experience, consulting experience, we probably have a good sense for what is actually doable in a certain given time span. Uh, at the same time, our deal professionals uh, at Advent, they are working within sectors. So they are also very knowledgeable about uh, the sectors, probably have deeper sector experience than, than most of us because we tend to be generalists. We work across the entire portfolio. And in many cases, uh, uh, we are also working with them in a, for the first time in a sector, potentially. Mm. Uh, and then our role is to kind of look at the, at the deal hypothesis from the point of view is, is how, how can management actually get this implemented? Are these the right levers? How, are, how is the sequencing of the levers looking like? Mm. What could be potential third parties to support uh, with the implementation of things? Uh, um, are we having any perceived uh, gaps in the management team that, that could become an obstacle for implementing things? What, what resources would we like to bring to play? And then together we're working on the invest investment thesis. Uh, but obviously at the end of the day, there is an um, investment committee that has to look at the different, uh, uh, at the deal from the different angles and uh, together we'll come up with a decision on what to do with the company. But, but we are really a supporting group. Yeah? It, is, mm. it is the deal captains who, who make the calls together with the investment committee. I can imagine that it must be hugely beneficial just from a kind of a grounding perspective to know what's what's realistic you know i've got that smart acronym in my mind you know s specific measurable but i think it's attainable or something like mm. that you know if you get enthused about a deal um you can maybe run away with yourself and to have someone to say hang on this is going to take a lot longer than you think could be quite helpful is that does that happen uh, or, or am I not giving enough kudos to the to the investment guys? I, I, I think uh, you're not giving <laughs> enough kudos to the investment professionals because I mean we have a quite ex quite experienced team who have done uh, similar similar deals before and who have a very very good assessment of what's actually doable. Yeah. Uh, and in many cases, we would have already worked with these individuals before on a on a on a past deal. So we we tend to be quite well aligned yeah. between ourselves. And then. Um, very rarely we have these situations where we would completely disagree on things. Right. Yeah. And then it's ultimately also, it's, it's a, it's a manage, kind of managerial decision to, to go for it or not go for it. And uh, a very, I, I haven't, haven't, I can't even recall a single deal where there would have been complete uh, differing views on mm. what's actually doable. I think we, we, are, we have a lot of experience in working together. Uh, so there are, for example, I'm, I'm spending a lot of time in the chemical sector. And since 20, 2011, 2012, I've been working with one senior partner constantly on different, different chemical deals. And we know each other quite well. So we also, um, we have a shared, shared experience. And I think we, over time, we, uh, we have learned on, okay, how, if, if someone says something, you, you, you learn what, what the specifics are that you should be listening yes. to and where, where to focus on. I think we, experience matters a lot, I think, in this. Uh, yeah, if you can profession. develop some rapport with your, with your investment professional partner, that's got to be helpful. And the same applies not just for the very senior guys. Because of this strong sector dedication, we have also people on the more junior levels that have repeatedly worked in the same sector with the same people. So we're quite, quite experienced uh, team overall with a lot of uh, sector experience. And that clearly helps. How large is the portfolio support group? We are more than 40 people globally. Mm. Within Advent and Europe, we're 12, soon 13. Yeah, so that's got to be one of the large teams, I would imagine. Well, we have built it up over the last uh, 13 years. So yeah. basically, on average, one one person right. per year, and I think uh, it it is very difficult to actually grow this grow these teams faster than much faster than this. We have had a few years when we we certainly had some step changes, uh, but say on average, uh, one person per year, yeah. and that has worked uh, well for us. We we tend to have a team with a 
high tenure. We had only one one person leave our team in the last uh, 13 years. So how do you hire? So obviously you need the geographic component, but do you also look for not just specific, are you looking for specific skills, specific sector expertise, or is it more general business acumen? We we follow a model whereby the people in, in our group are generalists. So we uh, we we we're not following a functional model. You could there is basically two archetypes um, of of how you can do this. One is where people would follow a functional perspective. So you have one expert who does uh, commercial excellence, one expert who does lean, one that is focused on procurement and so forth. Um, but you could also follow a more generalist approach where you say that one person tries to cover the entire value creation plan. And when we're in, the, in, this, in this second camp, um, with few exceptions. So over, over the last three, four, five years, we have started to build up more functional expertise, particularly on the HR and digital, uh, digital side of right. things, where we have people who are working on multiple portfolio companies in parallel and who are working alongside the, the generalists on a, on a specific company. But our basic philosophy is that one portfolio support person should be able to handle two, in some situations, three portfolio companies in parallel, right. and, but then cover the entire value creation plan. And then on an as-needed basis, we can uh, pull in specialized resources. We call them operations advisors. They are not employees of, of, of Advent, uh, but they work uh, on an exclusive basis with us uh, and support the management team on very specific programs. So it could be someone who has very deep IT, ERP uh, experience, someone who, is a, who has been a CPO in the past, who has very deep procurement expertise. And we bring these people in if there is a specific need in a portfolio company. Can I just ask you about those operational uh, operational advisors? They are not not, empl- employees, not of employees of the fund. So we I'm, we have we have a contractual uh, framework agreement with them, and um, we we are on a case by case basis bringing them in. They are not running consulting projects uh, within a within a company, so they are more mentoring, challenging, supporting. Right the functional, um, functional owners within the portfolio company. So Advent has had uh, this portfolio support group function for quite a while now, but you were one of the early movers. And people in recent years, I say people, your, your peers, private equity firms, have been speaking a lot about this. They've been building out their own teams. You were an early mover. You've come up with this model. To what extent have you been involved in kind of shaping it, I assume. You know, when you set up something new, it's very difficult to get it right off the bat. Have you come up with the model that you've just described or has it evolved? When we started this in 2009, that was when we were in this recruiting process, when when I was also considering that role, um, we, had, we had a senior partner at Advent who, who had done a lot of kind of due diligence, due diligence in what other private equity funds have been doing. And he he had kind of, he had an initial idea of what portfolio support uh, could be doing. And uh, well, then I was the first hire in Europe. Um, and uh, basically, I just got a very simple framework, which was uh, don't screw up anything <laughs> in, in the companies and, and be helpful. Just just be helpful. Uh, start with little steps first, support the management teams on, on smaller tasks. And then over time, probably in the first one, two years, we developed concept of chief transformation officer, um, how to define a VCP and uh, how to break it down into initiatives, how to track all of this. Um, finding the right ecosystem to support the management team, so preferred third parties with whom we would be uh, working with. And then gradually over time, it just developed into what we have today. So nothing was preconceived in the beginning, and it just, but it felt very natural, I yeah. think, over time. Um, but it could have easily gone gone wrong if the first one or two assignments had gone mm. had gone. Uh, sour, then probably we would have uh, we would have uh, rethought a few things. But uh, yeah, I think it has worked nicely for us. But that's the way how how Advent is doing this with this generalist uh, uh, pool and then a number of functional experts and and, and working across the entire portfolio, uh, the different sectors uh, yeah. that we have 
for other private equity funds, they may follow a different model that can equally yeah. be successful. So it's been evolutionary. Um, yes. That's, yeah, that's interesting because Advent is um, known for getting this right, for doing it well, I would say, generally speaking, in the market. Because it's, there is a, a, certainly a theoretical tension between, um, you know, a, an outfit that historically has just been all about doing deals. Not, I'm not talking about Advent, but private equity mm -hmm. in general, about doing deals and then bringing in this ext extra component. And so the way you describe it, that you've kind of grown organically that's probably a good way of doing it. Yeah, I think it, it only, at least I, I would think that it only goes this way. It has to be an evolution, mm. not, a, not a revolution. I don't yeah. think it makes, if you have something that is already working nicely and yeah. if you have strong sector dedicated deal teams, um, then you're looking at, okay, what is, what is the complementary capability that would support uh, the management teams and also the the advent colleagues in in making in trying to make this deal even more successful and that is that is this transformation value creation capability that we uh, can can bring to play i think what's also important is to to have a general attitude that the management is at the center of the value creation and that we are only there to support the management team in being successful in what what they are doing and one, once you have this basic understanding, then then you look at, okay, what can help management be successful? And you think about, okay, it's it's about the governance. It's how you set up these plans, how you, how, you, how you check whether we are on the right track. That's one element. The second element is, of course, a content element. So commercial excellence, for example, it may be the first or second time that the portfolio company is going through this. But for us as, at, as, at Advent, it may have been the fifth, tenth, fifteenth case where we're doing this. So it's also bringing past experience um, into play. And then it could be that there is someone, for example, on a functional level that uh, needs support, needs a mentor. He or she is probably doing the first carve out. There is a lot of experience needed in how you carve out an IT system, how you set up your own ERP and so forth. And then you... If you have a network of people that you can bring in who have done this before, but who don't want to do it themselves, but rather support someone yeah. in being successful doing it, I think then 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 you have the different elements that are required uh, to 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 make this deal hopefully successful. Besides all the other macro things that need to need to work out, I would imagine then that soft skills are going to be quite important because if the management are leading the charge on this. You know, it's it's kind of easy for private equity to go in and we're in charge and we're changing management if it doesn't work out. But if you've got to partner with people, they've got to trust you and to some degree like you, I guess. Yeah, well, the, the, this this is I think the the whole trick because on paper everything sounds sounds relatively straightforward. Yeah, you think okay, we bring the best of two worlds and bring them to play and we share our ex but but the reality is much more complicated actually. And and every deal is different. Yeah. So we have. Uh, I'm working a lot in chemicals. So chemicals has been during my consulting time has been my 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 deep spike, and and it's now also at Advent. Um, we we have a tremendous flow of of chemical deals in the last in the last years, and so I'm repetitively working in that space. But if if I look back to the different deals we have done there and that we're still uh, involved with. All these companies are different, even if they are working in the same subsector, uh, you notice that the management teams have totally different approaches and mm -hmm. they need a totally different way of handling and interacting. So we have very, very independent management teams that do not like and rely on external advice so mm -hmm. much because they, are, uh, they have a doing mentality um, where they rely a lot on their own teams. And then we have other teams who have maybe a different, different background, different heritage. They come from uh, parent companies that have used that, that were used to using a lot of external advice and mm. uh, and um, also rely on them and so the, the the value creation plans tend to be completely different not not necessarily in terms of the levers but in the way how they are uh, implemented and so is also the approach that you need to have vis-a-vis -vis the management teams mm. yeah i think the the most important thing is that you need to establish a trust-based relationship, no matter how the setup is in the company. Um, and you also need to spend a lot of time with the management teams, ideally on site, 
not just with the with the C suite, uh, but also with n minus one, n minus two, n minus three, to really understand uh, what what the opportunities are within the company. So I tend mm -hmm. to work a lot on the governance level, but then also do a lot of deep deeper dives when I, I would be working with uh, with the individual project teams to understand what's what's going on. When I was thinking of questions to ask you. Um, I kept thinking, well, the only answer to that is it depends because it's all so context specific. So I thought, well, we need to raise it up. And I did think that one of the uniting factors would be that people have just got to trust you and 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 get on with you. Um, what What's the spectrum of engagement that you would have with a portfolio company? So from this, this company's doing really well, very light touch through to actually things are going a little bit wrong. We need to get involved. Can you give us a... <laughs> As you said, it depends. <laughs> I think I think there is one 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 thing which has to do with um, how long we are now working together with a with a portfolio company. So in the in the beginning, certainly uh, after after the closing phase, it's probably the most intense time because everything is new. And very often we have carve out situations. There is a there is a lot of stuff that just needs to be done in the first months. Um, if it's not a carve out, it's probably the first time uh, that the management team is exposed to to private equity owners. So they mm. may not have the experience in working with us. And so there is a lot of time that you spend on uh, talking through, okay, how should we how should we set up the VCP? What are the right uh, levers to address? How should we sequence them? Do we have the right resources in play? So in the beginning, say the first first year actually, it's quite intense. It can be two or three days a week. And then over time, uh, when things get more mature, when everything is a little bit more settled, your inter interactions will be a little bit more punctual. So maybe it's it's a day a week. Then there is a second one which has to do with, okay, in which situation is the company? Yeah. Right. Um, certainly if if there is a bigger bolt on acquisition, a bigger acquisition, uh, then there is also there are more hands on deck required in order to to integrate that company. So there could be another spike later, as you mentioned. If the company is is, is going through more turbulent times, mm. I don't know. There is a need maybe to to look into the cost base. Then then you would also probably go deeper mm. and 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 spend more time. It 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 really depends. Yeah. In an ideal situation, <laughs> you have everything kind of going smoothly, and then you just focus on. On a few interactions per week, but uh, yeah, it, it's it all varies very much. There are times like the, like the current situation, particularly in, in the chemical space, where a lot of hands are required on deck. So it's certainly intense times. If you have seen this before, you know how to handle this, yeah. and uh, you know what's the best way of uh, supporting the management teams. Is if I may just jump back to a couple of the specific, you know, value levers as they're called. You mentioned that so you're mainly generalist, but you are start starting to hire a couple of more specialist people. And you said digital and HR. I can kind of imagine why you'd need specific digital people. It's technical and specific and so on. But HR as well, that strikes me slightly more of a generalist competency. I think it's all about people in the end. Yeah, we say the management team is at the center of the value creation plans. And uh, the management team is a is a broad broader definition. It, it's not just the mm. CEO, CFO, CIO, but there's also a management development agenda underneath. Uh, you want to have people and the right people in the right positions underneath. Mm. Um, you want to understand whether the organization itself is developing more muscle in terms of uh, people development, bonus systems, uh, retainment, um, ESG agenda is also. And quite an important element. Um, so there is the requirements are just increasing. The war for talent is is real. So mm. um, handling uh, search firms is also not trivial. Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you need to know who are the right partners for for which types of positions. And so we thought that it would be a very good investment into building up this institutional muscle on yeah. the recruit recruitment side, but also in the in the management development side. We, uh, I think two years ago, we started in Europe what we call the Advent Leadership Academy, where we have a little mini MBA type of program where we bring in uh, talent from the different portfolio companies together, um, go with them through um, academic classes, 
but also give them a better understanding of what private equity is all about and where we want to identify uh, talented uh, professionals early on and give them exposure to colleagues from other portfolio companies. So that's another example for a, a program that has been initiated by our uh, HR leadership team. So from speaking with various people in the industry, I've kind of noticed a general trend away from um, if there's a problem, we'll just change, we're just bringing different people mm. towards um, kind of nurturing or in trying to improve or support and mentor existing managers. I think every every change in the management team is always a disruption. Yeah. You know? So if the basic hypothesis is... Um, I, in an ideal case, we have already a successful management team um, or we support the management team in, in kind of uh, developing um, additional, uh, additional muscle. Exchanging people is probably the last resort, at least from my point of view, uh, that you should, uh, should consider. Uh, so I'm always proud if uh, we have a management team that doesn't change over time mm. and that together with us is successful mm. in, in, in implementing the value creation plans. Actually, there is sometimes a tendency to personalize issues that are probably not personal issues in reality. So mm. you have a problem, a challenge in the commercial space, and then because of lack of, lack of other, say, other reasons that, that you identified for, for this not being successful, um, you, you think, well, that has to do with the chief sales officer. And then mm. I exchange as chief sales officer and everything will be good again. That's, that's I think, sometimes too easy to, to go into that, uh, into that solution. Um, so I think there may be situations where it's unavoidable that mm. you need to, mm. need to make a change, but that should be the last resort. I think it's a very blunt instrument, isn't it? It's, it's cause it kind of it, it, it indicates it, that you haven't actually diagnosed. Sometimes maybe maybe goal. needed, yeah. So yeah, there, there may sure. be situations where a company has fundamentally changed because it's right. it's a business that started with a size X, and then three years later it's three X because yeah. of acquisitions, mergers, and then uh, people may not may not have the experience of managing a, yeah. a large organization, or there is a fundamental change in the industry. It's it's consolidating, it's moving away from, I don't know, a top-line driven game to a more cost, cost-focused cost game. And then you may require a different set of set of leaders. Yeah, you know, th this can yeah, happen. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, sure. but it should be I from my point of view, I don't feel I, I don't feel good if we have to change someone. What about bringing in uh, third parties? So presumably there are situations where you diagnose this specific need. What's mm -hmm. your uh, criteria for bringing them in and what do you look for? I think it's important to first sit sit down with management and, and st step back into, before we talk about third parties, is to look into, okay, what is the challenge? What, what do we want to accomplish? What is required in order to accomplish this? And then the first question is, do we have the right resources on board already today in order to deliver this? Uh, then, then you sit down with management and try to identify who would be the right third parties to support us for this specific uh, challenge. Uh, and then we bring in some third party resources that we mm. know from our past that have been successful, but also management may have had already very good experience with, with, with somebody else. And then we, we typically start a beauty contest, whatever you call mm. it, RFP process, and then try to identify who are the right partners for this specific situation. So we, it's not that we come in and say, yeah, no, you have to do this project with consultancy X, Y, Z, because we always do it like this. I think that's, right. that's not a, a recipe for success because mm. you want to have management accountable and in the driver's seat. Mm. So they should be ultimately the ones who make the decision in the end. Right. Obviously, we would be trying to influence that. Yeah, yeah. We would certainly object if we don't think it's the right third party. Right. But very often you have two or three choices. Mm. Um, and then it's also very often not the name of the third party advisor, so the company behind, right. but it's individuals. Oh. You know, the, these organizations have become so big. Yes. And uh, I think also there is the... <laughs> Or should I say the standard deviation <laughs> has yes. become bigger of, of of what you actually get, and so you, ideally, you you work with someone who 
is already trusted by management, yeah. uh, whom you trust too. And uh, you like to see people that you have seen in the past already and who have delivered uh, impact. I guess from a private equity firm's perspective, that flexibility allows you to s to see more people in action. You'll get a greater breadth of understanding. Uh, absolutely. Of I mean, I come from one consultancy and I always thought that uh, what we were doing was, was the best thing that could right. ever happen in a specific uh, space. Uh, but then when you see what, what all the others have to offer, then you realize that you only knew so little in the past yes. and that there is uh, the, the space out there is just huge but it's also tricky to navigate in, in that space you need to find the right ones for this specific situation and, yeah. and one firm that may have worked nicely in one situation may not be the right one in another situation just yeah. because the context is different the management team is different the style of management may be different so you need to be quite flexible and adaptable to it so the value creation plan it sounds like the key document is kind of like your north star as you travel through this this process uh you 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 kind of write it i suppose at the start of the investment how often in practical terms do you actually or you the management team refer to it and refine it and adapt it as it goes along or are i are you just up and running by that point well it starts basically with the with the deal thesis yeah, which is which is obviously driven by by the by the deal team. Yeah, the deal team is, is looking into different uh, investment opportunities, and for every investment opportunity, the, there's always the question: What do you want to achieve with this mm. company? What are the value creation levers and so forth? And then when when you get then involved during due diligence phase, you you bring in your own input, your own experience from your from your past uh, portfolio company situations, and then this evolves. To a point where you where this becomes part of the final investment thesis yeah. memorandum, right? Um, but then latest latest after after signing, um, you you also want to look at okay what what is management's view? Yeah, so you take your investment thesis, you combine it with the management plan already during the due diligence. The management will have presented a five year plan to to you with some some deal idea or some value creation ideas. And, and then you try to blend the two. Yeah, in many cases yeah. you will find that the things are complementary. You know that uh, you you have uh, you had had an idea in in one particular function and management had uh, something else in another function. Then they are additive. Sometimes you find that uh, their level of aspiration was maybe lower than what you thought uh, could be doable. And then you, you need to align it with management. You sit down, basically. You go through, okay, this is what we learned during due diligence. Let's now talk about what we learned in the due diligence, what your plans are. And then we try to combine the two things. And, and then we have kind of a starting value creation plan. It's kind of the, the things that we would be doing in the first two years or so. Obviously, there are sometimes longer term things that we that we need to initiate. Like if it's a, a roll up in a certain sector, you need to already think very early on, okay, what are the different acquisition opportunities and they may or may not work out. Um, but say on the more homemade things, things that you can do internally, um, it's difficult to think more than two years on. Yes. Yeah? Um and after two years, it makes sense to just sit back and, and mm. rethink what is kind of VCP 2.0 yeah. you know, and, and, and kind of what are the things that we should add. It, it's very rare that an initial deal hypothesis is still valid five years later. Yes. I mean, the, the core elements will still be valid, but the way how we get there mm. may be different. So it, it changes over time. And if you're in turbulent times like in the last years, yeah. where you have to cope with supply chain disruptions, you have to cope with energy crisis, um, you have to be very flexible. Because I was thinking, say you've got a three-year plan, but but you can't exit exactly when you want because the timing has to be right and so on. Yeah, timing and, timing is one thing, but also the industry as such uh, can can go through right. different different uh, cycle cycle phases of a cycle. Um, so in, in chemicals, for example a longer period of challenging times, let's put it this way, right. than, than, than it used to be a few years back. What's causing that out of interest? I don't know about um, the chemicals industry. Energy, it's disruptions right. uh, in the supply chain, that uh, it's, it's plants that are being taken out by suppliers, by competitors. So there, there is a, a quite radical change, I think, 
Uh, you see similar things in the pharmaceutical industry. We had a terrible uh, 2022. Uh, very challenging because of supply chain disruptions, products uh, that are coming from, from China, from India, precursors into pharmaceutical products that have gone through turbulent uh, times. And then 23 is a totally different year. Yeah, you see that mm. all these things that didn't work so well in 22 all of a sudden are, are coming into place again and that you, you go back from Seizing up. a smaller growth rate into a much higher growth rate. The, just right. the following year. So so you need to be adaptable with your with your value creation plans. Now that we've we've seen those risks being bore borne out, are you more alert to them on the way in to a company? Are you like, oh, this company is too dependent on elongated supply chains, or ha- have things just opened up more and that's a, that was a one off? People have become more critical of what risks you are willing to undertake with a portfolio you, you have learned from your past yeah, experience yeah. it's like every child yeah once you put your your hand yeah. on the hot stove on the hot stove yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah you you will probably be more careful next time and the same thing is here so if if you realize that um there could be supply chain disruptions just because you're dependent on single single source suppliers you will focus more on okay what is dual sourcing what is the lead time for a certain product i think this kind of collective experience is important that you mm. that you have that and that's that's also why it's so important to have a, a team that has experience in what they do mm. like i'm now 13 years in my role mm. most many of my colleagues are five six seven eight years ten years in, in in the same in the same role so they have already gone through a number of challenging economical yeah. situations so you learn from these things. Mm. If you're in a world where everything has gone just into one direction and yeah. all of a sudden you have to look into more challenging time, it's the first time for you. And then you do not have that experience. Mm. And having this experience doesn't only show you, okay, what should I be doing in a specific situation? But it also tells you that, hey, I've, I've, I've gone through this already in the past. It's going to be better uh, a few months from now, potentially. Hmm. Yeah, and you you just feel a little bit more relaxed about these things. You know things can go sour, but you also see that things can actually also turn around pretty quickly. So in practical terms, that means you do, you are, you're not as likely to overreact to downturns because… It's always difficult, particularly in supply chain. So you, yeah. the, the tendency that you overreact, you have too little, you have too little stock, then you overbuy, right. and then once you… <laughs> once, uh, you, you're not able to supply your customers uh, and six months later you have an oversupply of uh, of, of raw materials and and, and work uh, and, and uh, work in progress uh, materials and then your inventories will go up big time and right. then you have another challenge mm. yeah mm. so so this these experiences I think matter a lot and I think that's mm. why it's also important to to keep a, an experienced team yes. and not to have too many changes. Uh, so you need to have stability in your portfolio support groups. So there's an inverse relationship between the general trading environment and the, your your learning rate. But you can also learn from good times. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Better that way. Buy and build has become, well, for mm. quite a while, an increasingly important part of of, of the upside in a private equity play. Uh, that that strikes me as kind of a an investment side skill set. To what degree do the portfolio support group get involved in that in that type? Buy and build. It's a lot about the capability of a company to be able to integrate uh, the business that you have bought it, it varies a little bit by sector but if i look at the the more industrial space where you have physical goods that you're touching you, you need to be able to integrate that company into your sales and operations planning process you need to be able to integrate them into your erp landscape so there is a lot of institutional knowledge that you need to build up in order to be able to integrate those businesses quickly because very often your buy and build will be also based on synergies that you uh, can capture from from these companies and then it's it's important that you can actually realize those synergies and that requires that you integrate them um, there are certainly areas in the tech space that that work differently i can only speak of the say the industrial mm. industrial part so it's it's very important that you that you develop this capability as a company to be able to take a company, take your own processes, 
and put those processes into that uh, into that company that you acquired. The whole GNA space, sales and operations planning, production planning, and so forth. That is that is something where I think it is uh, where we can play an important role to be able to integrate those companies quicker. Are those skills diffused across a company, generally speaking, or would you like? try and create a unit for integration and transformation within the portfolio company or a bit of both? We have some companies that have a more constant flow of stream of acquisitions that have a, that have developed an, an M&A team that has these strong deal, deal capabilities, but who also have developed the capability to integrate those companies. So yes, yes, where wherever meaningful, you should have that as a dedicated team within the organization. Um, but it uh, depends very much on 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 the on the portfolio company and the value creation plan. How how important are bolt on how important are bolt on acquisitions in order right. to deliver the entire VCP? So it depends. It, yeah, it depends again. Yeah, there is no there is no silver bullet, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I've I've always tried to okay, what are the things that I have learned in this one company, and can I apply them one to one in the next one? It very rarely works. Well, at least that means your job can't be taken over by AI. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think so. No. No, and but, so, but AI yeah. is indeed it's it's one of the big disruptors. I think right. that we're currently currently seeing so. Um, how can we optimize GNA processes using AI? Which processes, sorry? Uh, GNA, so general and admin uh, processes, right. so back office uh, processes. It is a little bit of a, yeah, it's a mantra that has been constantly uh, preached. Yeah, yeah. Um, but there is something, it, it is disruptive. I think mm. um, I've also had to learn it, learn it over the last few months that there is, is really, you can, completely change uh, processes by by applying AI in an intelligent way. It's uh, interactions with your suppliers where you have an AI engine that is looking at data and, and even writing uh, memos that you would send to your mm. to your suppliers in an automatic fashion that you couldn't just handle in the past. Yeah. So it's a lot of examples like this. So it's something we need to seriously look into and we are looking into it. And presumably there's quite a lot of scope for knowledge sharing as well for something that's so emergent and generally applicable. Yeah, that's also why we have this, uh, we have built up this digital muscle in the last uh, 24 months, because that is something that is not sector specific. It's a capability that you can easily tr transfer from one portfolio company to the next one. And where you also need to have enough knowledge, a lot of knowledge to be able to navigate in this ecosystem that is mm. developing of different development firms software companies and so forth. And that is uh, nothing where I would feel very comfortable with navigating mm. in. Yeah, yeah. So you need someone who really knows this stuff. So as we move uh, through the, the life cycle of a deal and we get towards exit, um, generally speaking, would the portfolio support group have less and less to do with the deal because you've almost finished your... Normally... I said we are, we're having 12 people in in, yep. in Europe, so we need to be careful as to where do we spend our time on. Mm. So we always want to be short on supply so that actually we don't never come into a situation where we don't know what to do with our time. Yeah. Uh, so we're, we're typically not supporting all of our portfolio companies mm. because there may be some who are either from the beginning, they do not require a lot of handholding because the investment thesis is, is quite clear. Management teams know their stuff and it's it's relatively straightforward. Still needs to be done, of course. Mm. Um, but there may be other situations where the heavy lifting in the, in the VCP has already been done. Yep. And so we're at a later stage and then it's all about exit preparation. Mm. And then there are situations where we need to also prepare the company for exit just spending more time on them, working on an additional new wave of VCP activities. It, it's the exception, but mm. it happens that we are also involved until we exit the company. Yeah, But it, it's it's few situations. I think the heavy lifting is the first one, two, three years. But how do you feel when you when you say goodbye to a portfolio company, having worked with a bunch of people so closely for... You you hope all the best for them for the future, that they right. continue to be successful, yeah? Hopefully we have made a, a great exit for ourselves, but hopefully, I, I always hope that it's also a great investment for the next, for the next owner. Mm. Obviously, I want to 
want to see that the management team uh, continues continues to develop and uh, I, I it's not like you you sell it and then you you forget about it you yeah. you you're still interested and and also there are some sectors where you where you meet again you yeah. not necessarily because it's 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 it becomes another deal yeah like like a second acquisition yes. but it could be that you may work with this company as a supplier or as a customer right so mm. if you're in an industrial space in chemicals for example it can happen that your past portfolio company may become a supplier of, of a critical raw material three mm. four years down the road so the better your relationship to them the easier it may become to to work with them again, or it could be that individuals you meet them again in a different role yeah. in a different a different company. So it's it's uh, it's not that you it's not like fire and forget. It's quite exactly. the opposite. Yeah. So it's, it's it's private equity is essentially it's an iterative game, and I think that's what you know people who um, do not understand or are not involved in private equity. The general public perception of private equity can be very critical. You know, we get it sometimes in our comment section. Yeah, some private equity people are nice, but mainly they just buy leverage and sell. But what that misses is is the the integrated nature of business mm. and also the fact that you're not just doing one deal and then you're done. Your reputation spreads across time and across deals it's and across sectors. First, first of all, very practical things. You you can only make a successful exit if that company has a brilliant future ahead, because otherwise, who would be buying that company? So. Mm. Um, there, I, I'm coming from Germany, so we had what we call the the locus debate right. a few years back and before 20, 25 ish, uh, where where even the government was was stating at some point that yeah, private equity will come in and like locus will fall uh, over the companies and they would leave uh, nothing nothing left behind. I mean, it's a complete misperception of what we're trying to do. Yeah? We're trying to create industry leaders yeah, and, and long-term industry leaders and companies that are successful also for the next uh, for the next shareholder otherwise no one would be paying the premiums that we we hope to 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 get for those businesses and then uh, your reputation matters a lot in germany if you if you perceived as someone who treats uh, the management teams and the employees badly you will have a very hard time in in getting your next deal. Mm. Yeah, so I think it's it's quite important that uh, you 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 creating you're supporting you're creating uh, great enterprises and you treat the companies fairly in that process that you that you help help them become stronger and that also the public perception is as such. But you're always only as good as your last deal, actually. Uh, so. Right, like Hollywood. Yeah, it really it, it is like that. Uh, so the the memory is also uh, yeah mm. sometimes a bit short. So yeah. you've done more than a dozen deals. Do you look back generally and think this is a very worthwhile enterprise, created value, and yes, absolutely good for the world. Absolutely, no, no, de def definitely. I mean, otherwise, I wouldn't feel happy with what I'm doing. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I I enjoy every day of of this uh, professional life because it's uh, so. Or should I say, it's so diverse in terms of topics you have to deal with. That's interesting. But then you're also proud if you if you exit a company and you you see it uh, uh, being successful a few years later. Yeah. Well, that's a great point to close. But I actually have a bit of a cheeky question. Okay. Um, so I was speaking to a chief investment officer the other day, and um, we were talking about private equity firms themselves and how well run they are. And I made the observation that. Um, well, you know, you go in and support portfolio companies and make them better. So, you know, why isn't it just standard procedure to always be introspective as well? And he made the val valid point. He says, yes, but portfolio companies don't do it to themselves. It's actually quite difficult to make yourself better. It's easier to make someone else better. Now, you sit slightly separated from the main part of Advent's investment side, and you're always looking at how to improve companies. So just from your perspective, in terms of how private equity firms are run in general, perhaps, do you ever think, hmm, that could be done better? I'm sure we see, <laughs> we see this every every week. There are things where we would could think, okay, why are we doing it this way? Why aren't we automating the way how we are gathering information from the companies? There's a lot of things, but um, 
I think we 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 have a long history already. I think we were founded 1984, and since then the com- Advent has gone through tremendous growth, um, but also I think a lot of institutional learning. So I think we are very conscious about our own internal processes, how we develop people and so forth. And there is always things that you can do better, but I think the general direction has been very clear from at least since I am there. And uh, I think, uh, yes, we we can improve things, but we, we, we should not be trying to make an internal portfolio support group program just on, on our side. So we have a number of things, yeah. On the ESG side, we have done quite a lot. I think we have invested a lot of a lot of time and effort into becoming more diverse as an organization. I think we have done a lot of progress. We have made a lot of progress in the last years. So there's always things where you can get better. So complacency is probably the biggest uh, enemy of ourselves. Mm. And as long as we... Uh, we are critical uh, with ourselves as long as we try to improve things. I think uh, it will uh, will go well. Well, Alejandro, thanks so much for sparing your time for Fun Shack. It's been a pleasure speaking well, with you. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. You've been listening to the Fun Shack podcast, which has had more than 100,000 listens, but only about five reviews. And I think I left one of them. I know it's a bit fiddly, but it's easier from your phone and it's very easy to leave a rating. On Apple, for example, make sure you're subscribed, then go to your library, Click on Fun Shack, scroll almost to the bottom beneath the episodes and you'll see ratings and reviews. Give us a five, leave a comment. It's all the payment I ask. Thank you kindly.